Good morning, church family. Welcome to our service for the 30th of May, 2020. What a year it has been so far. So my plan this morning was to have my baby here with me, welcoming you all, but um, I'm afraid she's still sleeping. So um, I guess it's just me. Uh, I really wanna give you a warm welcome for this morning. And um, wherever you are, I don't know who you're worshiping with. I don't know who you're watching with this with, but you know, wherever you are, just like to the person next to you, just like give them a warm welcome that you're happy that they're there with you. Um, so you can do that now. <laughs> it's a bit awkward for the people that are live stream, but it won't be awkward because we can't see you. So you just go ahead and um, make sure you tell them how much you appreciate having the presence. So as you know, in New Zealand, uh, we've gone down um, to level two and now there can be 100 people meeting. But there's a lot of requirements at church and this is why we haven't opened our building yet. But church is still open in, in your homes. And um, because if you're with family, friends watching this, then welcome to all of you. This morning, um, I would like to read a text um, to you. And um, it is found in Isaiah 41, verse 10. And it says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am with I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So I know we live in uncertain times. I know we've been through a lot. You know, anywhere you are in the globe, you know, you you have been through something. And it is just an encouragement when we read this word that God is with us. And that we know that if he is with us, we don't have to fear. And that he will give us the strength that we need, like the text says. He will strengthen us in the situations that we need. And yes, he will be our help. And he will uphold us. Many times our situations, you know, that it's so much and overwhelming that we just want to go down. But it says that he will. It says I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And let me tell you that right hand is a symbol of power. And that right hand was the same right hand that took the, Egypt, um, the people of Israel out of Egypt. That it was that same right hand that created the world into insistence. So um, remember that God is with you. And um, that's our meditation for you as we welcome you. So with that, I just um, want to pray with you. And then we'll hand over to our praise and worship family. Um, so we get started. So here we go. Gracious Father, we're so grateful to have you as our God. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in the good times and in the bad times. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us in peace through the tribulation, Lord. Lord, you know that every situation of the people that are watching at the moment, Lord, is I just pray that you may give them strength like you promised to, Lord, and that you will keep them, you will uphold them, just like your word says that you will, Lord. May we claim these promises, Lord, and may we rest in your peace through this time of trouble. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, to Lila family. And um, we're almost there. Uh, soon we will see each other face to face. But um, uh, for the time being, uh, we just need to tell ourselves and remind ourselves to keep on trusting Him. And join us as we sing our first song for this morning. Um, I just keep trusting my Lord. They sing along with us as we sing and I'll ask Mr. Tevita to share the screen with us this morning so we can, we can all sing. There you go. Okay, let's sing along together.
we sing our second song for this morning what a blessing blessed assurance Jesus is mine he is yours too uh, sing along with us as we sing uh, our next song
You're muted faster. You're muted. Thank you to a little family. That was awesome. Um, so this is the baby I was going to do the welcome with. You want to say hi? Um, so we've been doing health talks and um, this week we have um, a sister Rekha sharing um, from us from Australia. Uh, she was part of our church, but then she moved, but she's, she can join us online. So she's going to share with us um, a health talk that helps us um, maintain healthy during this time. Thank you, Sister Rekha. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Henderson Church family. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, today, we will be continuing the uh, New Start series of presentation. So I would like to share my screen with you. So the first slide today, we will look at alphabet A, which is air. Of course, you know the new start acronym, which is uh, nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, uh, temperance, air, uh, rest, and trust in the Lord. So today we are sharing, uh, we're going to talk about air. The Bible says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Genesis 2, verse 7. With his breath, we have life. Therefore, air is the most vital element for humans and animals. We could survive for weeks without food or days without water, but without air, we would perish within minutes. And today's resources, uh, what I'll be sharing, has been sourced from Amazing Health website from Amazing Discoveries Ministry, a New Start Lifestyle Program run by Wilma Institute, and Lung Health Institute website. The presentation outline, some of the topics of this presentation will be uh, touched on what do we know about air, how do we get more negative ions, Difference between negative and positive ions and benefits of fresh air. The first one is going to be what do we know about air? We will learn a little bit of chemistry today. Air is roughly 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. And there are small amounts of other elements such as pollen, dust, mold, and other pollutants in the air we breathe. So the best air to breathe for optimum health is oxygen-rich, negatively charged air. The charged atom is called ion. Ions can be either negative or positive ions. The difference between negative and positive ions, negatively charged ions are attached with more oxygen. So negative ions are often referred as happy ions because they contribute better mood more energy, overall sense of being, whereas positive ions contribute higher levels of anxiety and depression. Often we think that if it's negative, it's not good, but in this case, negative ions are happy ions, which is interesting. Where can we find negative ions? This can be found in rivers, waterfalls, beaches, where there is constant motion, and also in forest mountains. So they all seem to congregate in the outdoors, specifically in the wild and natural outdoors. These negative ions are up to 10 times more than our bedrooms or offices. You must have noticed whenever we take a walk in the fresh air, we feel refreshed and calm and happy. So how do we get more negative ions? Go to a place where there are higher concentrations of negative ions. Intentionally take three to five very deep breaths. 
leave a window or two open, step outside for a minute every hour, grow few indoor plants. Finally, what are the benefits of fresh air? Air is the free blessing of heaven calculated to electrify the whole system from testimonies of the church. It was God's plan that we should breathe pure fresh air from the moment we are born until the moment we die without a single minute's break. One of the functions of air in the body is the burning up of waste products that are constantly forming in the body cells. When the supply of air is sufficient, waste matter is disposed of efficiently. The lungs are constantly throwing off impurities and they need to be constantly supplied with fresh air, the Ministry of Healing. Number three, air is an indispensable healing agent. No wound will heal without air. You can prove this by applying plaster to a cut. As long as the plaster excludes the air from the wound, it will not heal. The same rule applies to internal wounds. Unless the blood is charged with a sufficient amount of oxygen from the air, it will not accomplish its purpose. Not only that, if this blood is charged with impure air, it will hinder the recovery. Number four, deep breathing. Deep breathing overcomes fear, develops courage, and strengthens the entire nervous system. Deep breathing induced by natural exercise will work wonders. So take several deep breaths to clear your mind and increase your energy level. Like find the freshest air available, go outdoors if possible. And posture, stand erect. Draw as much air into your lungs as they will hold. Imagine it going right down into your belly. Feel your stomach expand. Hold your breath for a few seconds. Empty your lungs as completely as possible. Use your stomach muscles to gently push out the last bit of air. Repeat the process five or six times. Take a fresh air break several times daily. You know, most of us use less than half of our lung capacity. We are not getting all the potential benefits from the air we breathe. Consciously use your stomach muscles to fill and empty your lungs several times a day and deep breathing will soon become a habit. Also, a good exercise forces you to breathe deeply and speeds up the circulation of oxygen-rich blood throughout the body. This saturates cell with, each cell with oxygen. Whenever possible, exercise outdoors and in the morning when the air is cleanest. In the journal Environmental Pollution, the presence of trees is shown to have saved 850 lives and prevented 670,000 cases of acute respiratory systems. Trees not only remove a carbon dioxide from our air and replace it with oxygen, they also filter out pollutants. Number five, fresh air has many health benefits. It improves the brain's ability to function, gives clarity to the mind, improves concentration, and boosts learning ability. It gives a sense of happiness and well-being by altering brain levels of serotonin. It promotes quality of sleep and kills bacteria and viruses in the air. So proper ventilation is very essential for good hygiene. Increase the amount of fresh air by opening windows or changing air conditioning to bring in the fresh air. Air out your house every day. Keep proper ventilation in mind wherever you are. Avoid car, car exhaust tobacco smoke, and stuffy, ill-ventilated rooms. Number six, in order to have good blood, we must breathe well. Full deep inspirations of pure air, which fill the lungs with oxygen, purify the blood, and expand the lungs fully for healthy lungs. Our posture also plays an important role on the amount of air the lungs can hold. When we sit up straight and walk tall, we allow them to enlarge and work at our full capacity. When we habitually stoop or slouch, it is impossible to breathe deeply. Superficial breathing soon becomes a habit and the lungs lose their power to expand and receive a sufficient supply of oxygen. While preparing this presentation, I was taking several deep breaths, which I didn't do this before intentionally because we are so used to the superficial breathing. The Lord gave us his breath and gave us life. 
So let's take deep breaths and stay healthy and live stronger for him. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. Um, I just love how we've been learning about all these um, new stuff, how most of it is free and simple. And that's just the kind of God, you know, he provides things that are free and simple. So yeah, going for walks and waterfalls to the beach, deep breaths. Um, now we're gonna head over to uh, Mamede that's gonna do a prayer um, session. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath. Um, I hope your family, you and your family, have been keeping well during these extraordinary times. And that I hope that your week has also gone well as well. Yeah. We've, now come to, yeah. we've now come to one of our highlights of our service, um, where we can approach boldly the throne of grace uh, with our prayer requests and also with our thanksgiving. And we are only able to do this because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. So before we start, I just want to um, just briefly explain the structure for our prayer session this morning. So what I'd like to do now is to invite those who have um, prayer requests to send this through the chat on this Zoom or via Facebook. So throughout this, um, while I, I speak, I, um, I just want to invite those who have prayer requests and they would like um, the church to pray with them to send these through via the chat or Facebook. Then I'll read also, I'd like to, this morning, I'd like to read from um, the Word of God as well and just to share briefly um, from it. And then um, later on, uh, just shortly after, invite everyone to get into pairs wherever you are. Um, if you can find somebody, if you're able to find somebody to just pray together for each other, or if you're by yourself, pray um, to God yourself on your own. And then I'll close with a word of prayer. So at this time, I just wanna invite everyone um, who is a, um, who have got a prayer request to send this through Facebook or our chat on, on Zoom. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I just wanna share this text with us, a, a, a very beautiful reminder. And it's in Matthew 11, verse 28 through to 30, Matthew 28, sorry, Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. And I'm reading from the King James Version um, Bible. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek, and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because like I said, of what Jesus did on the cross, we're able to approach God's throne of grace. Um, you know, sometimes we go to church, I'm guilty of this as well. Um, we've had a challenging week or a day, challenging day, or just before church, something happens. And then we either decide not to go to church or we do, but we go grumpily and then we don't enjoy the service. But I'm reminded by this text that whatever the situation we find ourselves in, whatever challenge, church is for, church is like a hospital really, to bring everything, your challenges, your arguments, whatever your cares and your stress of the week or the day or the hour before the church, bring them all. Don't park them in the car park or outside the door. Go in with everything just as you are. This verse reminds us that God cares for everything. You know, God cares for us. And he cares for the minute problems that we have, as well as the big issues that we face. He says, if you are, as, as the verse um, reminds us, Come, come with everything, all your heavy laden, all your labor. It's a good reminder for us that God is there and that all we need to do is bring everything to him in prayer um, along with our praise and thanksgiving, um, thanksgiving as well. Um, and trust everything to God and have faith that 
He will take care of it all. And this morning, we just want to thank God again for his, um, his faithfulness, his care, and his love, and um, yeah, and care for, for, and concern for each of us. It's been a weird eight weeks, the last few weeks, few months have been strange. We found ourselves in a very strange um, times, but praise God for all his um, goodness, his faithfulness. We're able to not only share and come um, and pray online, even though our church is temporarily closed, we're able to do that as well as we're thankful to God for his um, faithfulness in terms of our health, in terms of um, the provisions that he has been able to allow for us to have every day. Even like Sister Reka has shared, even the air that we breathe, we're thankful and we're grateful that God is faithful um, um, with um, God is faithful in providing for our daily needs. So this morning, um, as we approach God's throne of mercy, I invite each and every one of us to, if you can, find somebody who's in your ho home or who's sitting next to you, just spend a few time um, in prayer, and then I will close um, with a word of prayer. And I, I, at this point, I'd like to invite those who are uh, online as well, that if you have any, just a reminder that if you have any prayer requests, um, send this through. If you'd like the church family to pray together with you for it, um, send, send this through on chat or Facebook. So at this time, I'm just going to give a few moments to everyone to get into peers where you can to pray for each other. And I will close with a word of prayer. If you're able um, to join me on your knees as I close with a word of prayer, I invite you to kneel with me if you're able, and I'll close with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we can come before you with our, our requests and our um, yeah, and our burdens. We thank you, Father, that through Jesus, we're able to bring this to you and to, and to leave this with you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you are a forgiving God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your provisions each day. We thank you, that you for, your, for your faithfulness and your care and your love for each of us. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath, Lord, where we can come together and worship as a family with you, um, worship you as a family together, Lord. Even though we're all apart by distance, Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who's able to um, be with us now and who's able to connect us as a family. 
We acknowledge, Lord, that we are sinners and come short of your glory all the time. So we ask, Lord, that you will please search our hearts and our minds and forgive us of all our unrighteousness and help us to, Father, to forgive each other and others who have done wrong um, to us, Lord. We, we acknowledge we are not able to do things on our own, so we just want to thank you, Lord, for your, for your help and your, your guidance. This morning, Father, as we're about to worship, as we continue with our worship, Father, we ask and invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. A special blessing upon the speaker of the hour too, Father, that you will um, anoint them with your Holy Spirit and that you will also prepare your people to receive your word this morning. Thank you, Father. We also remember those who are in need, whether in sickness or who need um, um, material or physical things, Father, or spiritually. We ask, Lord, that you will intervene in your own special way and that will bring your glory and honor, that will bring honor and glory to your name, Father. We just want to thank you for your faithfulness and we commit everything into your hands now, Lord, and ask that you will take care of these things, Lord, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Mamere, and thank you, church family, for being with us this far. Um, now we're going to have one last song before we, ha um, we have our, our special um, um, to share with us. Thank you, Toledo family. We are about to um, listen from uh, Kawe this morning. I invite you to join us as we sing our next song and prepare our hearts to receive the message this morning. Um, to join us as we sing a song prayerfully this morning. Thank you so much to Lilo family. So the time has come. A surprise speaker is someone that has never taken um, and um, 
in public before. But um, yeah, she has stepped up. And um, so yeah, pay attention. And uh, here we go, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can everyone see the screen? For some reason that didn't work. Sorry about that. Here we go. Morning, Henderson Church family and um, anyone else who's watching today, tuning in to um, online church <clears throat> and especially to my family and friends <laughs> who have taken the time to um, watch, listen to um, what I have to say today. <laughs> Um, so, in the last few weeks, um, actually I should introduce myself for those who don't know me. Um, <laughs> my name's Rochelle and I'm married to Axel Puga, um, who happens to be um, the Henderson SDA Church pastor. And we have a daughter, seven months old beautiful daughter called Safira. Um, she's the light of our lives. <laughs> and I could probably spend this half hour or so talking about her and how awesome she is, but I won't. <laughs> so um, I'll just say in the last few weeks, I've been feeling a need to share what's going on in my life and to tell a bit about myself and my story. Um, this is not something I'd normally do. Uh, it's completely out of my comfort zone, especially on such a public platform. Um, so I'm quite thankful that I'm behind a screen um, and not in front of a visible audience right now. <laughs> um, but I haven't been sure how to or when to share this. Um, and when I didn't really want to write a wordy post on social media that only you know possibly five people might bother to read <laughs> um I'd love to share this with as many friends and family as is possible not because I want to draw attention to myself I really don't um but I feel conviction um because I want to to make it known who God is who he is to me um, and not only what he's done and he's doing in my life and heart, but hopefully uh, I can convey to you what he can uh, be and do for you in your life. Um, and I'd love for both churchy and non-churchy people to hear this because um, I have been a church goer, a Bible reader, a prayer, um, and nominally an SDA Christian for all or most of my life. Uh, but it's taken me, uh, I think it's taken me about 25 years probably to feel like I actually know who God is and what his grace means to me and to actually desire to have him in my life and to be with him. Um, and that is not a result of 25 years of seeking him out, don't get me wrong. Um, it's not a result of 25 years of reading my Bible, um, attending church. Um, and Bible studies and praying and doing all the churchy or Christiany things that Christians do. Um, it is not a result of that. Um, although that has helped me survive spiritually, you could say. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on, I guess. But first, I want to avail a bit about myself and my story um, so that you have a better understanding of who I am, where I came from. Um, I don't want to give too much airtime to this because this isn't about me, like I said, um, and I don't want you to go away from this thinking of me as I was, what I've been through, my experiences, um, not knowing or understanding or remembering what God means to me and how much he has done for me. So for most of my life, um, I believe I have had quite a distorted picture of God 
um, coupled with a lack of sense of self-worth. And I know I'm not alone in experiencing this, so I hope whoever can relate to me can gain something from this. Um, I was born in Newcastle, um, which is kind of a city, <laughs> kind of a city in New South Wales, Australia. And, but I grew up mostly between a couple of little country towns, um, which are far away, more inland from Newcastle. Um, called Gyra and Armadale, which are, yeah, a little more inland um, and rural and notoriously cold during winter and autumn and spring. <laughs> um, so my family moved from the Newcastle area to Gyra when I was four years old. Uh, I'm one of five children, youngest of four girls and older to only one younger brother. Uh, I have a mum and a dad who celebrated their 36th wedding anniversary just last month. <laughs> um, so I'm very blessed to have grown up in a loving, stable home, although it wasn't perfect. Um, I've come to the realisation that pretty much every family has some level of dysfunction and that's just part of our life here on earth. Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful to have grown up in a home where my parents loved me and um, we were still married and in a loving relationship, probably more than, a, than now than I ever remember growing up too. <laughs> um, so we attended um, the small local SDA church in Guy for about four or maybe five years. Um, and unfortunately, our family had a lot of um, troubles there, uh, especially with some of the members, I guess. Um, and this affected my older sisters, my parents, not so much uh, my brother and I, because we were quite small at the time and um, didn't understand a lot of things, I guess. Uh, so my parents decided not to go there anymore and it was a few years before we started attending and becoming part of another church again. And in country towns, um, you're very limited to your choice of church service, unlike in the city. So it's not like we could stop going there and start going somewhere else uh, that easily, uh, unless we wanted to travel an hour or so. Um, so we lived on a very big property at the time, and about one hour away, like I said, from the nearest um, city, <laughs> Armadale, which is still quite small anyway, and only has one church as well. Um, so my mum has a teaching degree and she decided um, to homeschool all five of her children, which is, I think, an amazing feat and not something I can really picture myself doing personally, but then again, I'm not a teacher. Um, so well done to her, but because we weren't going to school and we had stopped going to church and civilization was about an hour away from us, we became quite socially isolated and some members of my family found that uh, that took a very yeah big toll on some, some of my family members, um, of course, and I guess we struggled in different ways, uh, responded to that differently. Um, yeah, my brother and I were good mates and we were happy for a while and we um, liked to explore and play around the paddocks uh, on the property we lived on. Um, but yeah, mum and dad struggled along uh, in their faith in God, I think, and we still grew up learning about God, Jesus, and the Bible and keeping Sabbath. Um, and that's something I really appreciate as well. Um, and at the age of 11, I remember I was going through a phase of reading a lot of books, especially Christian books. And in the middle of uh, reading one night, late one night, um, I decided to uh, leave my bedroom, which I was sharing with um, one of my sisters and my brother at the time and go to the lounge room where no one was because it was so late and I um, 
I knelt down by the lounge and I decided then and there to give my life to Jesus and so I prayed to him and um, and it sounds strange but I do remember feeling what seemed like uh, almost a physical weight come off my shoulders um, <laughs> and a feeling of peace and joy that I'd never experienced before and that memory has never left me. Although I didn't completely understand what it meant to give my life to Jesus, it was the first time I took ownership of my faith and started intentionally learning about and practicing Christianity um, and who Jesus was to me personally. So I was reading the Bible more than I ever had before and learning and seeing things for myself that my parents had taught me. Um, and, and I wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge my parents I express how grateful I am for the time they invested into my life, my spiritual walk, and for their prayers for me. Um, so during my ad early adolescence, not long after I'd made my decision to follow Jesus, Mum had been invited to attend a sermon series at the local Anglican church, and she took me and my brother with her. And what ended up happening is that we started to attend regularly um we started going there we went for a few years um and got to know uh people there and we enjoyed fellowship again with christians um mainly just the three of us um and we formed some lifelong meaningful relationships and we reached a church actually and and our spiritual walks were enriched so it was during those years that we were attending the Anglican Church in Grara and my brother and I were joining the youth group on Sunday afternoons. Um, it was during that time that I developed an illness uh, which took its toll on my health, my family uh, and my relationship with God. Um, I thought about whether or not to disclose what this illness was um and how helpful it would be if it's really worth being vulnerable and opening up about this part of my life so publicly um i don't love the thought of, of naming it um but i have decided that if there is anyone listening who has struggled with the same or similar thing as myself that it will be worth being vulnerable and opening up about it publicly. Uh, so my illness was diagnosed as anorexia nervosa um, and it's quite a complex um, disorder, illness. Um, it's the type of eating disorder for those who are unfamiliar with this type. Uh, it's um, it's different for everyone who goes through it, but what usually happens uh, is that a person develops very strict eating patterns. Um, and often, not always, uh, but as a means to compulsively lose weight and achieve a thinner physique, um, they'll yeah, start themselves, restrict meals, cut back on certain types of food or a certain number of calories or whatever. There's, there's all manner of types of restrictions and rules that you can self-impose in this illness and for many different reasons it's not just because you want to look a certain way um, but yeah that can be that can definitely factor in and it definitely did factor in for me um, at least at the time so as a result of this illness I lost a lot of weight I had very poor mental health I had social phobia for a while um, and I had such a low sense of self-worth and I wandered from God and one day I chose not to surrender my illness or my life to him anymore thinking that I couldn't really struggle through anorexia with God but here's the thing about God he is like a loving father uh, he does not disown us in our personal struggles but he wants to help us through our struggles whether it's sickness or sin or anything. Uh, he wants to be the strength and help that we need during our lowest times. 
um, how close and how loved we are by God is not based on our feelings. But I did not realize that when I was 12. And I kept my thoughts and struggles and self-hatred to myself. I didn't open up to anyone about this at the time. Um, and somehow I felt I was not good enough for God or anyone else for that matter as I looked for a sense of worth and identity in things other than what or who I was raised to find it in. Um, but with a bit of time, treatment and therapy, I did actually come back to physical health, I put on weight and I overcame a lot of my social phobia. Um, though not completely, I'm still quite a shy person uh, as most people who know me would know. Um, and I started to enjoy being with my peers and other people again. Even at church and youth Bible studies, youth group. Um, although I was not personally walking with God, I still enjoyed socialising through church and churchy things. <laughs> um, so for the sake of time, I'll say that I did eventually decide to come back to God and to include him in my life again at about 15 years old. But I didn't have any peace. I felt like God had rejected me, that he maybe couldn't take me back as his, that I had let him down and that I had lost my salvation. I had committed the unpardonable sin, which uh, for those of you who don't know is um, something Jesus talks about in Matthew 12, 30 and 31, I believe. Um, so you can look it up for yourselves if you like. Uh, yeah, so I believe that I had committed that sin um, and that I would not receive his mercy or eternal life in heaven. But the only thing I would have to look forward to when Jesus returns would be his wrath and him condemning me to be lost forever. So my biggest fear for a big chunk of my life has been to stand in the presence of Jesus and hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you which is something Jesus also said in another passage. Um, and so consequently, I'd be cut off from my loved ones for eternity and from God. Um, so now this is not to say I always felt lost or distant from God. I tried to keep my faith in him, to read his word, to pray, to let him lead my life. And he did lead me. Um, and I can remember some prayers that he did answer. I know there were many times I would hear him speak to me in different ways, um, not audibly, but through the Bible, through people, through music, sermons and experiences. Um, God definitely worked in my life and there were seasons where I felt close to him, but many seasons I felt distant and that my relationship with him was dependent on um, myself and what I'd done, basically. Uh, for example, I do remember at the beginning of my second year of college, over five years ago, um, I was going through a confusing time in my life. Um, and I remember telling God and asking him to lead the right guy into my life at the right time. And for me to be content being single for the time being. And so I was happily single for about a month before Axel asked me to date him. And I was happily in a relationship with him. And I am sure that God was leading me and answering my prayer and apparently the prayers of my dad at the time, <laughs> who I found out later had been praying for me to find a godly man to marry. So because I, I couldn't ask for a better husband or a better father to our little Zephira. And God blesses us and leads us and even uses us, not only when we feel close to him and firm in our faith, in him, but also when we feel distant from him and are unsure of our hope and salvation in Jesus. And, um, and actually, I want to take a moment here I want to say how thankful I am for Axel and his genuine faith in God and desire to reflect Jesus and his purpose. Uh, his understanding of God's compassionate, gracious nature and passion for people. Um, has uplifted me many times in my own walk and especially recently as I'll talk about later. So anyway, I have spent many years struggling with doubt and insecurity, doubt for my self-worth, doubt for my salvation, 
doubt for God's ability to forgive me and rescue me when this world ends. Um, and my illness in the past uh, is one that tends to rear its ugly head at times uh, in varying degrees, which usually puts a wedge between me and God uh, and only strengthens my doubts and self-hatred. And instead of caring for myself and those around me, I tend to instead compare myself and measure myself against other people, just like I did with my eating disorder. So, um, yeah, I guess you could call um, my eating disorder in the past sort of a thorn in the flesh now, I guess, <laughs> for those of you who know that passage, but I won't talk too much about that now, um, but it's, to be honest with you, something I still struggle with, uh, with those tendencies of restriction and stuff. In my life, I still have to battle that from time to time. So, coming back, um, I compulsively read my Bible for a while every day and compulsively prayed for the last 10 years, uh, fellowship with other believers and did it mostly to please God. Uh, for a false sense of peace that I was doing what he required of me, um, whether I would consciously consciously admit that or not, subconsciously I believe that that is that was the case. Um, and in retrospect, the same habits and thought processes I experienced in my worst stages as an anorexic, um, I applied to my spiritual life. So do this for so long. Uh, for this often, for this much worth, um, and your previous self, you'll be up to a certain level of worth. Um, and although I spoke about God and had an intellectual understanding of what his grace meant, I always felt an obligation to have to pay him back for saving me or to do things to prove that I was worthy, to bear his name as a Christian and to show that I would be good enough for heaven. So when things started to get serious, um, fast forwarding to 2020, um, in the past few months, when things are getting serious, like with this coronavirus pandemic, um, I started having a lot more anxious and depressive thoughts, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, these are pretty stressful times for a lot of people for different um, reasons, and so. For me, I also started thinking a lot more about the people in my life that I love and really care about. Um, they're really important to me. And I started to think about where I stood with God. To be quite honest with you, in recent times, I questioned my relationship with God and whether or not he really meant much to me at all on a deep personal level. Um, if someone had asked me to give my testimony to them earlier this year, I would either stumble through articulating an intellectual make-believe account that lacked conviction or I just wouldn't, I haven't, just wouldn't have a testimony. So I questioned God, his character, why he was so hard to please and how I was supposed to find the energy to work at pleasing or appeasing him after all the years I have, um, I failed to meet a million and one standards. Um, whether they're so self-imposed or not. Um, and when I reflected honestly with myself, did I really want to go to heaven anymore? Did I really want to be someplace where everyone is worshipping a God who I not only feared, but had little desire to know or be around when he seemed so demanding of me? I felt empty. I felt hopeless. I felt like a phony, a lame excuse of a Christian. Um, and due to my understanding of God's standards and my debt collective view of his character, I was also reverting a lot to my inner voice's standards for what would give me value as a person and what would make me more worthwhile in the eyes of other people. This mindset was exhausting um, and I had a lot of thoughts, um, a lot of anxious, depressive thoughts. Um, uh, 
and a desire to escape somehow from facing up to my eternal fate. But I didn't know how that was possible. And um, so I tried as much as I could to push these things to the back of my mind, but everything was just coming to the front and I had to face up to it. I couldn't live like this forever. Um, feeling like such a shell of a human being. Where did I stand with God? Where did I want to stand? Why was my faith still part of my identity? And did I still want it to be? Even though I had very little conviction of what God meant to me. I knew at the same time that I wanted to be with my family and other loved ones for all of eternity, if it were possible. And I didn't want to see any of them lost or condemned, separated from God or from me if I did make it somehow into heaven. I started thinking a lot more seriously, more than ever, about my family. Um, both my own household and the one that I grew up in, uh, my husband's family, my friends, and the people that have meant something to me or I have meant something to in my life. What did God want from me? What did he want? What did I have to do to have peace again? What did it take to have the hope and assurance of his salvation that I had seen in people like my husband and so many other people throughout my life who just know that they know God and they have the assurance of him welcoming them into his kingdom one day. Um, but again, what was, what was the point of living with God in my life if I knew this world is coming to an end sooner or later? And even if not in my lifetime, what was another 50 or 60 or 70 years of my life? Really, would it count for anything? Um, how much would I regret it if I didn't get myself sorted? Um, or give God another chance to get me sorted before I realised it's too late. So... I really had to think seriously about this and um, I decided uh, just a couple of months ago back in March, early March, I think, um, to open up to my husband about it and Axel was driving us down to Cuddy Cuddy to visit my grandma and my sister and her family actually. Um, we were driving at night and I was doing a lot of thinking and I can't remember how the conversation went where it did, but Axel is a very caring husband and he often asks me how I'm going. Not just on a shallow level either, um, but how I am really going. And so I decided to be honest with him. I spoke about how distant I'd been feeling from God over time. How I didn't really know him anymore and it felt like a fake for identifying as a Christian yeah. and how I questioned not only if I still had God's salvation but if I ever really could have and hold on to that assurance that so many Christians so confidently talk about. This had been especially hard considering Axel was starting his official job as a pastor and I'm his wife, I'm a pastor's wife um, and I want to be the best support I can be, especially spiritually for him. So I picture myself um, being, I don't know, a lot more active spiritually and switched on spiritually uh, to support his role as best I could. Um, but I felt inadequate that way too because I wasn't having what I felt was a genuine experience with God and him working in my life. And his word, the Bible, seemed so dead to me when I read it. It was literally just like reading words off a page and a little more. But you know, you may or may not be able to relate to this, but as I was speaking this aloud in the car to my husband, I was already feeling a load come off my shoulders, um, just putting it all into words. Sometimes that, re that really helps. That's actually a lifesaver for many of us. And Axel's non-judgmental, understanding and unassuming response showed me that I didn't have to bear this weight alone and that I didn't have to pretend anymore, not with him and certainly not with God. 
I was reassured that I not only could be honest with God, but I needed to be honest with God, especially if I didn't want to stay this way, stuck, confused, lost, hopeless, feeling worthless. And so something God showed me just this morning, which I thought was interesting, was this. Um, just as when I was starving myself, even when I chose not to eat, when I was struggling the most with my eating disorder. And my parents, my parents not only still loved me, but fought for me and my life. So God still loves me when I fail to feed myself with his word. I'm still his child. I'm still worthy to him. I am his own. Even when I starve myself spiritually by not reading the Bible, not talking with God, uh, not serving him practically, uh, he still loves me and fights for me, seeks me out, even at my worst, just as my parents did when I was practically heading for death. Um, only if I had died would I not be their child. Um, I was still their child when I was so sick. And I'm doing myself a disservice, just as a side note. Uh, well, not really a side note, it's quite important. Um, just as if I don't eat, uh, when I starve myself spiritually, it doesn't make me any less worthy or any less loved by God. Um, when I fail to meet um, certain standards or when I fail to seek Him more than I, I when I fail to seek Him as much as I could through his word or through prayer um, and do his work on this earth. So um, I just want to share something with you. It's kind of a journal entry, kind of a Bible study meditation that I did um, not long after my conversation with, with Axel. And he sort of helped me realize that I don't have to meet a certain requirement for reading the Bible. I don't have to meet a quota. Um, I don't have to be so restrictive like I was with my eating disorder about um, my relationship with God. Nothing I do makes me any less or more worthy. And um, so I just decided to read what was digestible for me um, in terms of the amount that I read at a time. Um, and so I started reading just a few verses every day um, up until a point where I felt God say something to me, or so, um, till verse, um, I re until I read a verse that I thought I could really relate to, or really resonated. And, um, it's probably the best, um, time with God I've ever had in my life, um, is doing it this way, just waiting, just read till he speaks to me. And it could be a few verses, it could be a lot of verses, um, but that's really enriched my spiritual life one, one way. Um, and so I would, just want to read you this, um, this thing that I wrote um, after reading uh, 1 Peter 1 verses 6 to 9, a couple or so months ago. So the verses say, from 7 to 9, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And upon reflection, this is what I wrote. This passage is telling me that it is possible to completely trust in Jesus, so much so that you rejoice and look forward to his coming, whatever troubles you are facing. For so long I have been more fearful than joyful because of Jesus. I want to hope and eagerly wait on him. I want to have full confidence in him that he is my total salvation. I want to stop relying on my circumstances and feelings to feel secure about anything and know that he's 
he's got not only me, but my husband, my daughter, my family, Axel's family, and all our loved ones. Instead of wasting time worrying about whether I'm saved or not, I want to have the conviction that I am and to use my time on this earth to pray for and minister to others so that God can use me to reach and save them too. Especially my family. For too long I have been afraid of God and afraid of speaking to others out of concern for their eternal life. I do not want to be driven or crippled by fear any longer. And this was a key moment in my life very recently. Um, she made me realize that I'd been stuck. I've been trapped in a, um, a way of thinking, a way of living, um, which kind of dooms me to be lost and those around me, I'm not, I'm not there for. Um, so like I said, um, I've been wasting my life worrying and questioning about whether I'm saved, worrying about um, the merit of Jesus and really whether what he says, um, that I'm saved by his grace, through his faithful, faithfulness, through his work and nothing of my own, nothing that I do can change his love for me, my worth, um, and for me to be saved and to have that assurance, um, all I have to do is believe on him. And it's so cliche that, that we become kind of immune to it, um, especially us who grow up in the church, we become immune to this truth that sometimes it takes a bit longer to grasp it. And I feel so sad that it's taken me this long to really grasp this message and what it means for my life. Um, so, I'll read you another verse um, from Romans 6, 22 and 23. But now having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, or servants of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. That's it. You don't have to do anything um, to save yourself. Um, God sets us free um, from our debt. We have nothing to pay back. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is not a debt that we have to repay. It is a gift from God. And Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for us to have that. Everything we do after we choose to accept Jesus um, to rescue us from, from hopelessness in this life. Um, is to believe in him, to accept his gift, his sacrifice, and um, yeah, everything we do after that is a response to what he's already done. So when I believe this, when I choose to believe this, and I have chosen to believe it, Even on my worst days, like I, I try to, to hold on to this, knowing that God is with me, God is for me, and his interest is in um, seeking and saving the lost. His interest is for us. He wants us in his, in his family, in his kingdom. He doesn't want to shut us out. He doesn't want to say, have to say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. Um, all we have to do is simply respond by accepting him and letting him work through us. Um, so on a practical level, I'll, I'll share another verse, actually. It's probably my favourite at the moment um, because I think it sums it up really nicely of what we're required to do. 
in this life. And it comes from Micah 6 verse 8. I haven't looked it up yet, so. <laughs> Micah 6 verse 8, and I'm reading from the New King James. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So, God doesn't require us to do things to save us. But what saves us is when we humbly come to God. Um, acknowledge who he is and that we are his child. Um, if we accept Jesus as our saviour, our sacrifice, um, the one who represents us and um, it's his, his righteousness, his goodness that is imputed to us. So um, then we take on God's character and Christ's mission and that is to be loving, to be merciful, to do justice. And just let me say as a side here um, that we are not required to judge other people or to say what they can and can't do in their walks with God. Um, we're here for each other, to build each other up, to encourage each other, um, to be accountable first to God and then to each other. Um, but I wasted a lot of my life as well in my own spiritual insecurity, feeling like um, I wasn't good enough and I had to prove myself. I wasted a lot of time judging other people and looking down on them and um, pointing out the wrongs of other people, whether to, the, to their face or not. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter but like yeah that's what I spent a lot of my time doing and I didn't see people the way that God sees them and God has changed my view of people and of himself completely and um I no longer want to judge people I no longer want to hate people I it's my honest desire that they would um, they would come to see the hope that I've come to see in Jesus. Um, I'm kind of just talking off the bat here, so excuse me <laughs> um, for my words lacking. Um, but yeah, his when we look at Jesus, his mission yeah was to heal people, to to heal the brokenhearted, to uh, seek and save the lost, um, to set captives free, um, and to proclaim good news to um, most common or most poor people. And I need to wrap up now. So, <laughs> um, so that's our mission too when we come into God's family, um, and that is our work. But that's not what saves us. Jesus saves us, and. Um, we just need to believe that and we all have peace and joy and we can hold on to him and be a better servants to God and to each other when we um, claim that truth for ourselves. So thanks for listening. Um, if you have um, any more questions about my story or something wasn't clear to you, um, then don't hesitate to contact me and if you want to reach out because you feel like something in my story you feel like you could really relate to, um, then I'm happy to talk as well. <laughs> so thank you for time and um, praying, be praying for all who hear this, um, that you'll have a better understanding of God's grace, like I hope I continue to do. <laughs> thank you. Really want to thank Rochelle for sharing that and um
just for her honesty and openness. I think a lot of us should be as open. Um, so with that being said, I'm just going to do a prayer and um, close us off. Um, thank you all for um, being with us this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your loving mercy. We thank you because you love us even when we don't deserve your love, Lord. Thank you for constantly seeking us, Lord. Father, we know that there's a lot of struggles in this life. And, you know, the beauty of being a Christian is that, one, we have a loving Father. But, two, that we have a loving community around us that can be open to helping us in our journey, Lord. All of us are struggling in this journey together, Lord, and may we learn to be the support for each other, Lord, because maybe one day we'll be down, but then we have a brother to pick us up. And when the brother's down, we can also help that brother up, Lord. So thank you for making this family unit, your family, family of God, Lord, in this world. May we live up to what your word says, Lord, and may we accept your grace. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord, and I pray a special blessing on everyone that's watching this video, wherever they are, Lord. May you bless them, Lord, and may they feel the, your presence with them today and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Have a blessed um, rest of the day, and may God be with you. Bye-bye.